So we're studying the book of Joshua, as we should know by now. We were looking at this um, for um, three months last year. And then because of lockdown, we, we stopped. Um, and we've resumed this year again. We're now on session number 23. Only a few more to go. We're nearly there. Into May, and that's, that'll be us finished. But we're tracing in particular the theme of victory through obedience. There's, there's lots of different themes you could practically trace through the book of, of Joshua. But this is what we're particularly looking at. Victory through obedience. Obedience, obedience to God, obedience to God's word. But more than just looking at the historical fact of the obedience of the children of Israel meant that they secured victory, but how do we apply that to our lives today? What difference does that make to me in my little life, going about my duties and my um, activities during the week? What difference does it make for me? Last time, Rodney looked at the principle of the cities of refuge and how the children of Israel set up these um, now that they were taking possession of the land. And it was the the instruction of Moses, of course, that was passed down, and Joshua then um, instructed them. But we noticed again how that instruction was not just a historical instruction of this was what was done, but there is instruction for us today as well that we can take refuge. Not in a particular named city. Camborne is not necessarily a city of refuge. But we can take refuge in all that Christ has done for us on the cross. Hallelujah. Today, we're going to look at another of the instructions and the principles that the children of Israel had learnt from previous generations. They'd learnt it from Moses as the law had been delivered and so on. And now, as they were entering into the land and taking possession of the land, they were getting to that point where these instructions could now be put into practice. Again, we will learn, I hope, what it means for us today, what we can take from this. And advance notice, this uh, this, this sermon title for, for today is A Portion for the Priests. But advance notice, this is not just a message for the pastor. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's read the passage. It's a lengthy chapter, but we're going to read the whole thing. Um, it, It may seem like it's just a whole lot of names and and a geography lesson of the of the nation of, of, of Israel. But this is God's word, so that's why I'm going to read it. I was tempted to to, um, to just read the few verses that we were going to that, that have particular reference. I was tempted maybe to get somebody else to read it. But I think as part of the preaching, this is God's word. So let's read it. Chapter 21 of the book of Joshua from verse 1. Joshua 21. This is what God's word says. Then the heads of the fathers' houses of the Levites came to Eleazar the priest and to Joshua the son of Nun and to the heads of the fathers' houses of the tribes of the people of Israel. And they said to them, At Shiloh in the land of Canaan, the Lord commanded through Moses that we be given cities to dwell in, along with their pasture lands for our livestock. So by command of the Lord, the people of Israel gave to the Levites the following cities and pasture lands out of their inheritance. The lot came out for the clans of the Kohathites. Now remember, there were three sons of Levi, And the tribe of Levi, there was uh, the Kohath, Merari, and Gershon. And so here we're we're looking in verse 4 at the Kohathites. The lot came out for the clans of the Kohathites. So those Levites who were descendants of Aaron the priest received by lot from the tribes of Judah, Simeon, and Benjamin, 13 cities. And the rest of the Kohathites received by lot from the clans of the tribe of Ephraim, from the tribe of Dan, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, Ten cities. And then another of the sons of Levi, the Gershonites, received by lot from the clans of the tribes of Is- tribe of Issachar, from the tribe of Asher, from the tribe of Naphtali, and from the half tribe of Manasseh in Bashan, thirteen cities. And then the third son, the Merarites, according to their clans, received from the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Gad, and the tribe of Zebulun, twelve cities. These cities and their pasture lands the people of Israel gave by lot to the Levites 
as the Lord had commanded through Moses. Out of the tribe of the people of Judah and the tribe of the people of Simeon, they gave the following cities mentioned by name, which went to the descendants of Aaron, one of the clans of the Kohathites who belonged to the people of Levi, since the lot fell to them first. They gave them Kiriath Arba, Arba being the father of Anak, which, that is Hebron in the hill country of Judah, along with the pasture lands around it. But the fields of the city and its villages had been given to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as his possession. And to the descendants of Aaron, the priest, they gave Hebron, the city of refuge for the manslayer, with its pasture lands, Libna with its pasture lands, Jatir with its pasture lands, Eshtemoah with its pasture lands, Holon with its pasture lands, Debir with its pasture lands, Ain with its pasture lands, Juta with its pasture lands, Beth Shemesh with its pasture lands, nine cities out of those two tribes. Then out of the tribe of Benjamin, Gibeon with its pasture lands, Geba with its pasture lands, Anathoth with its pasture lands, and Almon with its pasture lands, four cities. The cities of the descendants of Aaron, the priests, were in all 13 cities with their pasture lands. As to the rest of the Kohathites belonging to the Kohathite clans of the Levites, the cities allotted to them were out of the tribe of Ephraim. To them were given Shechem, the city of refuge for the manslayer, with its pasture lands in the hill country of Ephraim. Giza with its pasture lands. Kibzeim with its pasture lands. Beth Horon with its pasture lands. Four cities, and out of the tribe of Dan, Elteke with its pasture lands. Gibbethon with its pasture lands. Ajalon with its pasture lands, Gathrimon with its pasture lands, four cities. And out of the half tribe of Manasseh, Teanach with its pasture lands, and Gathrimon with its pasture lands, two cities. The cities of the clans of the rest of the Kohathites were ten in all with their pasture lands. And to the Gershonites, one of the clans of the Levites, were given out of the half tribe of Manasseh, Golan in Bashan, with its pasture lands. The city of refuge for the manslayer, and Beth, Beth Besh Terra with its pasture lands, two cities, and out of the tribe of Issachar, Kishion with its pasture lands, Dabirath with its pasture lands, Jarmuth with its pasture lands, Ein Ganim with its pasture lands, four cities. And out of the tribe of Asher, Mishal with its pasture lands, Abdon with its pasture lands, Helkath with its pasture lands, and Rehob with its pasture lands four cities. And out of the tribe of Naphtali, Kedesh in Galilee with its pasture lands, the city of refuge for the manslayer. Hamath Dor with its pasture lands and Kartan with its pasture lands, three cities. The cities of the several clans of the Gershonites were in all 13 cities with their pasture lands. And to the rest of the Levites, the Merarite clans were given out, the tribe, uh, out of the tribe of Zebulon, Jokneum with its pasture lands, Karta with its pasture lands, Dimna with its pasture lands, Nehalal with its pasture lands, four cities. And out of the tribe of Reuben, Beza with its pasture lands, Jahaz with its pasture lands, Kadamoth with its pasture lands, and Mephath with its pasture lands, four cities. And out of the tribe of Gad, Ramoth in Gilead and its pasture lands, the city of refuge for the manslayer. Maonaim with its pasture lands, Heshbon with its pasture lands, Jazer with its pasture lands, four cities in all. As for the cities of the several Merarite clans, that is, the remainder of the clans of the Levites, the, those allotted to them were in all 12 cities. Phew. That was a marathon, wasn't it? We're almost done. Verse 41. The cities of the Levites in the midst of the possession of the people of Israel were in all... 48 cities with their pasture lands. These cities each had its pasture lands around it. So it was with all of these cities. Thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land that he swore to give to their fathers. And they took possession of it and they settled there. And the Lord gave them rest on every side just as he had sworn to their fathers. Not one of all of their enemies had withstood them for the Lord had given all their enemies into their hands. Not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. Hallelujah. And has been continuing to come to pass ever since. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We read a passage like this and we wonder with all these names and 
We know, O oh God, that there is more than just a geography lesson for us today. And so we pray, by the power of your Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, we pray, would you speak to us today? Would you bring the scriptures alive? Would you make them meaning for us, meaningful for us today? And would you apply these things and these principles that we read of in our lives, we pray. All to the glory of our Lord and Saviour Jesus. Amen. Now, it is somewhat of a mouthful, isn't it, all of those names? <clears throat> I've been up hours this week trying to practice all of those. <laughs> and not entirely successfully, as you could see or hear. But in this chapter, we see God's wonderful provision once again for his people, don't we? Last week, God gave them a series of cities, places of refuge, places of safety, places of security, in case of the manslayer, in case someone, someone's blood was slain. There was a city, a safe place that they could go to to receive justice and the right level of justice, as Rodney pointed out to us um, last week. In this chapter, he gives them 48 cities, which were to be, if you like, spiritual centers. Places where the Levites, the priestly clan, could live and serve God. But first, a little bit of history. <clears throat> right from the time at Mount Sinai, when the children of Israel had come out of, uh, of Egypt, and God delivered the law to Moses on Mount Sinai, he ordered that the tribe of Levi should be set apart for his service, to serve him in particular as priests. So what is the function of the priest? What is, what is the purpose of a priest? Well, firstly, the priest represents God to the people and speaks to the people on behalf of God. But also, the flip side of that, the priest also represents the people to God. You remember in the, in the old tabernacle system, that tent that they erected in the desert, the priests would take the offering and they would go into the Holy of Holies. They would go into the presence of God on behalf of the people. The people couldn't go in because God was so mighty, so holy. And so it was just the high priest that would go in. And then once a year... So he would, he would go in representing the people and appealing to God on behalf of the people. So there was these, these two aspects of the, of the role of the, of the priest. He was effectively a go-between. He was to hear words from God and deliver that to the people and represent God to the people, but also he represented the people for God. One who stood between, you might say, God and the people. So the tribe of Levi, they were set apart by God for the spiritual life of the nation of Israel. That was their purpose. That was, that was their function. And we'll look a little bit more of that in, in, in a moment or two. Now, some of the, the children of, of Levi, some of the, the sons of Levi, um, they would have been engaged in all the practical work. We've, we've referred to the three sons as we read through that passage, Koath, Merari, and, uh, and Gershon. And Koath, for example, had a particular responsibility. The sons of Koath, it was their job to carry the ark on their shoulders and the precious things. Now, if you go back to, um, to, to Numbers and Leviticus, you see the detail in those passages there that, that, the, that the children of, of Merari and the children of Gershon, they were given carts to carry all the furniture to carry all the curtains of this tabernacle, all the poles and all the boards that, that were erected every time this tabernacle was put up. And they were given carts in order to carry this stuff. But the sons of Kohath, the Kohathites, were not given a cart. They had to carry their things on the shoulder because they were precious. This was something con uh, considering the, the holiness of the presence of God there among them. It was there at, at, at the ark with the mercy seat on top of the ark that the presence of God was known. So you couldn't just put those things on a cart. They had to be carried. And so there were practical functions for the children of Levi. But also from these tribes of Levi, priests were selected 
to serve in the tabernacle and, of course, later in the, in the temple. And we have that account, don't we, of, uh, uh, in, in, of around the birth, of, we remember it at Christmas time, around the birth of the Lord Jesus. And that message that came to one of those priests whose turn it was to serve in the temple at that time. Because they were set apart for God, they didn't inherit huge swathes of land, huge portions of land, in the same way that the rest of the tribes did. But they had physical needs. They needed a home somewhere. All these, these tens of thousands of, of, of people of the tribes, uh, tribe of Levi, they needed somewhere to live. They needed somewhere for their cattle, just the same as all the other tribes needed. And under the instruction from Moses... God provided for them. He provided for that need. And in this chapter, chapter 21 of Joshua, Joshua and Eliezer the priest are distributing the cities where the Levites could live. And most of this chapter, as we've read it through, details and lists the name of these 48 cities. You'll have noticed as we read through the list that a number of them were also um, the, the cities of refuge, So as well as being a spiritual centre, some of those cities, there was a place where people could go for safety and security and to find refuge. And effectively, the way that this was done, each of the tribes that had already had their portions of land allotted to them, each of the tribes gave up some of their cities to allow the Levites to come and live in in those places. But the way that it was arranged in God's wisdom, and under the the leadership of of Moses and Eliezer here, the way that it was arranged meant that, that whoever you were in the tribes of Israel, and wherever you lived throughout the whole land, from Dan to Beersheba, you were never too far from a priestly city. You were never too far from one of these spiritual centers where the Levites lived, where the priests lived. And as we come to the close of the chapter, verse, um, uh, 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 from verse 41 onwards, and particularly verse 43, we're reminded of the faithfulness of God. The people had rest from all the battles that they had done. It had taken a number of years to get to this point of, 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 of doing battle to overthrow the major cities in the land, but then to take possession But we get to this point at the end of of chapter 1 where where God's promise of a land for his people that he had given all those years ago to Abraham, God's promise was now fulfilled. They had rest from all of those battles. This was the nation of Israel now in the land of Israel. And victory came through obedience to God's word. This is, remember, this is the theme that we're tracing through the whole of this book here. And we get to this point at the end of chapter 21 where the children of Israel experience this rest from their battles because they were obedient to God. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to whitewash the story here because we've noticed as we've gone through the passages that there were plenty of times when they weren't obedient to God and they had to suffer the consequences But overall, what they had been learning was that victory comes through obedience. The challenge from this point on is that victory would be maintained through continuing obedience. It's all very well. You get to one point, you're obedient on one aspect, and you gain victory there. Well, now I can go do what I like. That's not the principle at all, is it? Not for the children of Israel, not for us today. We have to go on being obedient We have to continue following God's word if we want to experience victory in our lives. Now, what do we learn from this chapter today? Most of the commentators look at this chapter, and and I have a a pile of books like this which, um, which help me with my study, but most of the commentators, when they look at this chapter, they speak about the need for church congregations to provide for those who lead them for the pastors, for the elders. And that is a right application of this, of this chapter. And I feel a, bit, a little bit awkward um, speaking about that here, standing here as the pastor, but that's, that's what, that was the principle here that was established. 
God said to, to all the, effectively said to all the tribes of Israel, he said, you're going to provide for those that, that serve me continually, day and night. You're going to provide for the priests in your community. And each of, these, each of these tribes of Israel, there were cities allocated within each of the regions, and, 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 and their possession was given over to the, uh, to the, the, the Levites. So, that, so that's the, the, the main application that we can take from this, from this chapter. But actually, I want to speak about something else this morning. I want to look at this from a slightly different perspective. In, in saying that, I don't want to detract from one moment from what I've just said. Okay, that's that principle that the, the commentators that speak of, that this chapter speaks of the, of the whole congregation providing for the, the uh, spiritual leaders of the church. But I want to look at it from a different angle. The New Testament makes it clear that we are all priests before God. Now, the time that we're talking of here with the children of Israel, there was one of the 12 tribes, one of the 12 sons of Israel who was allocated to be priests. Now, not everybody in the, in the Levites would have been priests. It would have only been certain people from within that tribe. So it was just a small, select group of people who had the privilege of standing as priests before God. Now, this New Testament principle that we go on today was, was really reinforced at the time of the Reformation 500 years ago. Martin Luther was, uh, was a principal proponent with this. Previously, and today with the Roman Catholic Church, the priests are in an elevated position. What the priest says goes. And, the, and you have to be a priest and go through the, the ordination of being a priest in order to properly interpret the scriptures. And, and ordinary lay people like us are not qualified to interpret the scriptures. That was the accepted norm up until the Reformation. or That, that had become the accepted norm in, uh, in the early years of the church. Not in the first century, I don't believe. Uh, maybe the second or third as well. But, but up till 15, uh, 1400... Um, nearly 15, just, over, just past 1500, that was the accepted norm. The priest was in an elevated position, and he was the only one authorized to read and interpret Scripture. But the principle established at the Reformation was based on 1 Peter chapter 2. Peter says there, You are a chosen race. Now, he's speaking collectively to all those he's writing to, and by extension, he's speaking to us today, all those who are followers of Jesus, all those who have put their faith and their trust in Jesus and know that their sins are forgiven. He says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. So God says to you today, the Holy Spirit would say to you today, if you have faith in Christ, if you know that your sins are completely forgiven, washed in the blood of Christ, then you are a priest before God. And not just that, but you're a royal priest. So that refers to our position, our title, if you like. Peter says, you are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. But in the earlier part of the same chapter, 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter tells us that we're living stones. You remember that reference, don't you? He tells us that we're living stones in order to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. So the later, the later portion gives us our position, our title, if you like. You are a royal priesthood. But he also says, Peter also says in that same chapter, about us being a holy priesthood. In other words, our, our, our function, if you like, our function as priests. You're living stones. We're called living stones in order to be a holy priesthood, in order to offer spiritual sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. So the Levites had their position and their function. They were called priests because that's who they were. But they also had their function. They were the things that they had to do. They had to act as priests. Um, and the high priest would take the offering into the Holy of Holies and so on. And whilst the rest of the tribes of Israel were given great swathes of land, the Levites had none. The rest of the tribes of Israel, that was their inheritance. God says, I'm giving you this inheritance. Here's your portion. 
Here's your portion of land. Go and possess it. Subdue it. Work the land. Live in it. This is your inheritance. But the priestly tribe, the tribe of Levi, because they were busy with their work for God, God says to them, I am your possession. He says to them, you don't need whole swathes of land because I am your inheritance. He says, but I will provide for you. I'll give you 48 cities dotted right up and down the the land for you to live in and for you to look after your, your, your livestock. And I'm going to use your brothers and sisters in all the other tribes to give you those cities. But I, the Lord God, am your inheritance. So on the basis that we here today are all priests, our inheritance is in Christ. We agree on that principle, don't we? We, the, The New Testament is clear for us there, that we are priests, a royal priesthood before God. And what is our inheritance? Our inheritance is Christ and all that he has won on the cross. The meaning of that is that we shouldn't look for an earthly inheritance. That's what the children of Israel were doing. They were pursuing the plan that God had for them. I'm going to give you this land. So they were looking for this land. And they were looking forward to this land. And then they took possession of this land. And, and lived in this land. And it was all about this, this, this earthly inheritance that they had. And they were pursuing that. And indeed they still are today. And of course, in, in, and since the, the, the mid-20th century, you had, this, you had this great move of, of vast numbers of, of, of Jews coming back to Jerusalem. And all the focus is on, is on the land, is on the place. And the place is important, and it's, it's God's provision for his people, for the Jews. But we have a wonderful treasure in Christ. You know, many of you know by now that we, um, two, three, three years ago, I think it is now, we, we were incredibly blessed to go to, to Israel. And, and seeing the city of Jerusalem there, it was... It was, it was such an eye-opener for me. I don't know why I hadn't realized it before, but actually being there and seeing it and walking the places and so on and so forth, you realize that, that it's as wonderful it is, as it is and to walk along the Via Della Rosa, the way that Jesus probably walked on his way to the cross, to, to see the places that Jesus engaged with is amazing, it's fantastic, and it brings it all to light. But it's just a place. The important thing is Christ and what Christ has done on the cross. That is our inheritance. My inheritance is not Jerusalem or a lovely little village in Galilee. My inheritance is in heaven where Jesus is. Yes, one day I will ret- uh, he will call us to be with himself. What a day that will be. What a prospect to see Jesus face to face. And I believe scripture teaches that there will be a period of a thousand years where Christ will reign on this earth. And he will reign with his saints. He will bring us with him. And yes, we'll then we'll get an earthly inheritance for a time there. But the ultimate inheritance is in Christ and in Christ alone. Jim Reeves used to sing, didn't he? This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. I'm showing my age, aren't I, Gina? <laughs> I do remember it. <laughs> but let us not pursue earthly, worldly possessions. You know, I, I, I used to hear, I think we've, I was talking with Bob about this in one of our elders' meetings. I, I used to hear the phrase a lot about being worldly and worldly Christians and so on. And I know we've commented on it before. But this is what we're talking about. It's not an old-fashioned phrase that we're using when we say that. It's the problem of being rooted in this world and looking for your inheritance in this world, and looking for your enjoyment in this world. Now, that might be your home. It might be your job. Or your new job. It might, be, it might be your car. Or it may, might be your latest iPhone, i12, or whatever the latest iPhone is. I lose track of the numbers. Or these things that we have, the possessions that we have. Are we rooted in those things? Or is our inheritance rooted in Christ? And in Christ alone? 
God, in his grace, gives us the things. He gives us homes. He gives us cars to get about. He gives us iPhones to contact one another, or there are other devices, of course. Um, but you know what I mean. He gives us all these things to help us to function and, to, and to, to live, to exist, in just the same way that he gave the Levites these 48 cities across the breadth of, of Israel with their pasture lands. So they were provided for. They had homes. They had somewhere for their, for their cattle. But my appeal this morning is let us not put all our energy in these earthly things, in these worldly things. Our real possession is eternal. Our real possession is unfading. You know, when we talk about inheritance, we often think about wills, don't we? Somebody passes away, they write a will to say how they want their possessions to be distributed once they've gone. And that's a, that's a good, I would, I would commend people to do that. <laughs> Being an ex-bank manager, having dealt with many of these cases, I would commend everybody to make a will. Um, but we, we write out these instructions, this is what we want to happen. But at the end of the day, once I've died, and I've written a will, and Jackie's written her will, but once we've died, once our body has cease to function. The things that I leave behind mean absolutely nothing. Because the only thing that goes forward, the only thing that is maintained, is my knowledge and my experience of Jesus Christ. And my link with him. And my, and my connection with him. And my, that my ability to call God my father. The almighty God of the universe. Who spoke the universe into existence. Who gives us our very breath day by day. I can refer to him as my father. Because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's the thing that matters. Now I know we're tested by this every day, aren't we? Because we have our possessions but let me encourage you to hold them lightly. Hold your possessions with open hands, as it were. Don't hold tight to the things that God has allowed you to, to keep and to use, whether that be a new car or your new phone or whatever it is. Don't hold tight to it. Hold it with open hands. Because if it goes, it goes and it doesn't matter. Because we have an unfading inheritance in the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I think I'll be, I'll be tested by my own words there. As some of you know, we've put our house on the market, just testing. Let's see how things go. We may end up selling the house and not being able to buy a new one. And Jackie said, that's not a problem. We'll live in the caravan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you might well titter over there. But actually, that doesn't matter. Because my home is not here in Camborne. My home is not on Agar Road near Luggan Highway. My home is, is, is not in a caravan in a field somewhere. My home is in heaven, where Jesus is. Now what I need to do is I need to start living my life as if I believe that truth. Because that's what we're getting to here. Um, uh, God was saying to the, to the children of Israel, he said, I want each of you to provide for this family, for the tribe of Levi. You need to do your bit, whether it's paying a regular monthly amount into the church, and into the church coffers, whether it's providing the pastor and his family for, with a meal or whatever. Bless you, thank you, that was a lovely meal last night, we enjoyed it. Or whatever the practical things are, these things need to be done. But God says it's much greater than that because every single one of you are, are priests. And don't therefore try and obtain this plot of land as your inheritance, because your inheritance is in heaven, where Jesus is. Don't hold tightly the things that God has given us. Hold them with open hands. If he wants to take them away, he can do that. But what he has assured me is that no one, no one in all of the whole universe can take me out of God's hand. Praise his name. No matter what I may go through, no matter what struggles I might face, I can never be snatched out of the hand of Jesus and out of the hand of the Father. It's a double hand. I need to preach another time on that, on that principle. But it's a double hand. We're in the Father's hand, but we're also in Jesus' hand. And no one can snatch us away from that. That is our inheritance. 
And everything else can go because one day it will. It will be left behind and we will have Jesus. So as priests before God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, let us find our possession, our inheritance in him alone. We're going to sing a final song. I'm going to pray in just a moment. Now we're going to sing a song, Knowing You, Jesus. Because that's what it's all about. Knowing you, Jesus, there is no greater thing. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we, we do love you. We thank you for all that you have done. We thank you for who you are. And we thank you for all that you have done in order that we might have a heavenly inheritance that is unperishable, that can never be taken away from us. We thank you for all that you did on the cross that meant that we can be called children of God. We have the right to be called children of God. And so we pray, would you help us this week? Even today, as we go from this place, would you help us to put these things into practice, to not hold tightly to the things of this world but to hold tightly to you Lord Jesus and to prove and experience your faithfulness to prove the blessing of knowing you that there is no greater thing so bless each one of us we pray Holy Spirit would you minister to us even as we sing this song to close, would you minister to us and, and massage your word, God's word, deep into our hearts to make it real in our lives, we pray. We ask these things in Jesus' wonderful, precious name. Amen.